So here it is, this forgotten amount of programming, strictly speaking, structured programming. So I'm going to take the other side of the previous tool. I'm going to look at the code. Um, as I said, we are installers of art most of the time. Um, I've been collecting photographs of broken systems for many, many years. Most people just look at these, they get used to them, and they go, OK, well, I don't really understand what's going on. Um, and they look at this and they say, oh, free packets. Where can I claim my free packets? <laughs> Me, I take a photograph. In fact, I've been taking photographs for so long, that's quite a big one, actually. That's Madrid Airport. Um, I've been taking photographs so long that people now send me photographs, and they tag me on Twitter. And it's got to the point that I've become a word, apparently. Um, this is from three years ago. Arriving in Bologna, I saw a Kevlin Henny screen. Um, so, and somebody said, you're never safe from a Kevlin Henny. I think we're at safe distance at this point. But it's actually become, uh, it was mentioned that I used to write for the register. Well, uh, somebody else I know writes for the register, and I've ended up in there. Three Kevlin Hennies at Waterloo Station. A Kevlin Henny is a humiliating public software failure photographed and tweeted to the eponymous account. Kevlin Hennies are frequently seen at ATM machines and supermarket checkouts, but the best ones usually occur at transport hubs where they enjoy the full benefit of giant displays. Uh, and somebody has also generously added um, me to, the, uh, to Urban Dictionary. Now normally I use Urban Dictionary to understand my teenagers, uh, but apparently I'm now in there. A software failure that happens in some public space, for instance, an airport flight information screen that has crashed, or an ATM that displays a reboot message. Oh, look, the, the bus monitor just pulled the Kevin Henney. What I love is it says, get a Kevin Henney mug. <laughs> when I pointed this one out to my wife, she said, it's fine, I've already got one. <laughs> so I'm not really here just to talk about failures, but this is by way of introduction. This is who I am. But I'm going to go back. We're going to... I want to explore, I want to use the term art very broadly. Art comes from the Latin ars, meaning skill or practice. And there is indeed an element of um, the visual side of it that I want to touch on. But when we study the arts, we are studying something that involves skill, sometimes imagination, often to do with culture. And one of the great arts, or one of the subjects that is normally described as an, uh, under the banner of art is history. And really to get an appreciation, because with software development, we're not very good at understanding our history. So let's go and find some history. Um, to do that, I'm going to take you back in time. I'm going to take you on a journey back to the 1960s. How do we do that? Time travel is impossible. Oh, no, it isn't. Not if you use Facebook. They've been messing with the timeline for decades. 31st of December, 1969. This is a, another great Kevin Henney, if you like. It's a bug. Uh, the beginning of time was the 1st of January, 1970, according to the Unix domain clock. Um, that was time zero. Um, this is likely an error that came about because of a zero and then a time zone adjustment, which pushed it into the 31st of December, 1969. Now we're back in the 60s. What happened in the 60s? Well, guess what? Um, 50 years ago, this happened. Um, humanity set foot on another world. Um, this was partly enabled by software. It was, very un it was underestimated at the time how important software was. Um, fortunately, this woman, Margaret Hamilton, uh, was kind of responsible for uh, some very key things that allowed the moon landing to happen. But she also developed the, she invented the word, uh, the phrase software engineering. Um, so, what did people mean? What were they referring to? There were a lot of misunderstandings about the term software engineering most of which are not interesting, um, and many of which are false. But when it comes to the idea of, let us build on practices that we know and understand, well, that becomes quite useful. So, this is, this is um, taken from, uh, uh, this is a book published in the early 70s, and it mostly written in the late 60s. It's a book entitled Structured Programming. And uh, by Uli Johan Dahl, Edsger Dijkstra, and Tony Hall. Um, and there's a number of interesting things that come out of this. Um, 
some of the work was inspired by this guy Robert Floyd. And in his cheering award speech, 1979, he talked about the paradigms of programming. Now what is interesting here is not just that the word paradigm is one of those terrible English words that is put into the language just to mess up people's sense of pronunciation. Because it's got a G, but you don't pronounce the G. Except when you say paradigmatic. Yep. The rest of the time the G is silent. This is one of those things that people sort of say, you know, English would actually be quite a simple language if somebody straightened out the spelling. Ah, oh, that's too easy. Tell you what, let's mess up the spelling. Genius. So, the paradigms of programming, it's actually Robert Floyd who we have to thank or to blame for the use of the word paradigm in software. It's not that it's a new word or a word that is not otherwise used, but its popularity was boosted into software thanks to this, the paradigms of programming. And what he's talking about, he wasn't talking about the way that we tend to view paradigms these days very, very narrowly. We tend to view it as, say, functional versus object-oriented, as a contrary aspect. No, his vision was uh, a lot deeper. He felt that um, he, what he would call paradigm, we now call patterns or architectural styles. And he was talking of ways of thinking. And he opens with this observation. A familiar example of a paradigm of programming is the technique of structured programming, which appears to be the dominant paradigm in most current treatments of programming methodology. Uh, However, the problem is, when most people hear structured programming, they think, oh, this is all about not programming with GoTo. Okay, it's, oh, we're so over that, because it's the 21st century. <laughs> oh, you're so sweet. Uh, no, we're not over it. Um, we still program with GoTo's all over the place. And I'm not talking about the assembler. Uh, we have um, slightly downgraded GoTo's. Um, but it's also worth understanding what is, what is the buzz about GoTo? Why, why did it cause um, issues and problems? Um, and also going back to the 60s, 1968, we have Edsger Dijkstra's um, quite famous letter to communications of the ACM. The go-to statement considered harmful. Now, that's a wonderful example, that phrasing, go-to statement considered harmful. It's the first time it was used in this way. Um, and it, it, it's given rise to something that is quite interesting. Now, one of my interests hobbies is, is language and words, and I run a page on Facebook, Word Friday, and occasionally I will showcase unusual words uh, or, or, st uh, or phrases. And one of the most useful words in this context is the word snow clone. This is not a typical English word. What is a snow clone? Um, a cliched wording used as a template. I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with templates. So the idea of a parameterized phrase, and it normally originates in a single quote. X considered harmful. These aren't the X's you're looking for. X is the new Y. It's X, but not as we know it. No X left behind. It's X's all the way down. All your X are belong to us. And the go-to statement considered harmful is the origin, is the point of origin for all those considered harmful blogs that you now see, and talks that you now see. Microservices considered harmful, da, 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 considered harmful. That all originates back in 1968 with that go-to statement considered harmful. If you like, that was, that was actually, curiously enough, not the original title of the piece. The original title was a much more moderate, a case against the go-to statement. Um, but the editor, at the time, a certain Nicholas Wirth, who is better known for inventing Pascal, he decided to change the title to be a little more, I don't know, these days we'd say clickbait. Yeah? You'll never believe what happened when this programmer used a go-to. Oh, I need to click to find out. So, every now and then, it's, oh, it wasn't, it's not really a problem. Yeah. XKCD, I can restructure the program's flow or use one little go-to instead. Ah, screw good practice. How bad can it be? How bad could it be? Um, this is code taken from the SSL layer in uh, some of Apple's code. It's 2014. This is known as the go-to-fail bug. This was a bit of a mistake. The indentation does not suggest it is actually misaligned with the intent. 
This is a classic example of a, this is a perfect storm. It's not, I'm not going to blame it all on GoTo. This is a perfect storm of GoTo, copy and paste, and not using static analysis tools or high enough warning levels. You might say, oh, this is C code. C code's always going to be wrong. Not always. I mean, you are probably using an operating system that was written in C. So, you know, it's good enough. It's good enough for operating systems and running the, running the web. So it's not a bad language. It's just that you kind of have to help it. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Turns out the SSL bug was quite a big deal. Um, and this is an important thing. One of the books that uh, I edited a few years ago, uh, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know, uh, collected number, together a number of interesting pieces, which I think are, are, are worth, I still think are worth uh, going back to. And one of the ones here from by Sarah Mount, take advantage of code analysis tools. We don't do that enough. Sometimes people perhaps express too much art in their code and don't rely on automation. It turns out that we can get things checked, and honestly, that go-to fail would have turned up immediately. Similarly, had they written, had they done testing? It's, uh, most code is not tested well. Testing is the engineering rigor of software development. And indeed, uh, Mike Bland, formerly of Google, wrote this very uh, interesting piece uh, based on go-to fail and the Heartbleed bugs and other related bugs. These bugs are as instructive as they were devastating. They were rooted in the same programmer optimism, overconfidence, and haste that strike projects of all sizes and domains. This is actually, this is, uh, this is common culture. Uh, say, oh, it, it's fine, It'll, this'll just work. It'll never be a problem. I have found that most bugs in my experience happen in the things where you don't think they could happen because they're so simple. It turns out we're really good at the hard stuff, but we really screw up the simple stuff. So, as he points out, He's lived and he talks about the unit testing. Strongly imprinted experience compels me to reflect on how unit testing approaches could prevent defects as high impact and high profile as these SSL bugs. Now, I'm not strictly going to talk about testing, but I am going to talk a little bit about correctness, and I'll come back to a couple of points here. Now, I'm going to take you back in time, but while we're doing that, I'm briefly going to nip down here. Sorry, I need to just... Oh, it's over there. Because I've just realised, because I surrendered my laptop to the back of the room, it means I actually have no clock. Now, much as I would be happy to talk about this all morning, I suspect you would probably like to go to other talks at some point. So I need a timing device. Turns out that time is, uh, time is something that we can travel through, but I'm very good at being late on it. So, um, so I'm gonna take you back in time. This is, uh, see, can I just check? Anybody here done, done C at any time in there? Career. Okay, only a few of you. This is old school C. This is K and R. Coming in a Ritchie C, which is really not very strongly typed. And I've tried to be idiomatic in the style, relatively idiomatic. This is how to calculate whether or not a year is a leap year. In other words, whether or not a year has a 29th of February according to the Gregorian calendar. Okay, and I've made it locale independent. Now, I could do it in one statement, but for the purposes of this talk, I want to take the simple idea and expand it a little bit into separate structures. Now, this is the way that some programmers would probably write it, in kind of classic old school C. Um, there's no true and false. Um, you just use zero and non-zero. One is the most likely non-zero value you're ever going to deal with. Um, Sometimes people like to put in extra curly brackets. Sometimes people like to put spaces in between. It turns out that this is a great way, if you're being paid by the line of code, this is a fantastic technique of taking a really simple idea and making it, now, that it has become a, an idea that you should always have curly brackets because of errors like the go-to fail. But that actually misses the point. I don't think there's anything wrong with leaving out the curly brackets. What you need is to do all the other things. The problem is not the language design here. The problem is you're not using static analysis, code reviewing, or testing. That's the real problem. So if people think they can solve the problems of static analysis, reviews, and testing by using curly brackets, good luck to them. This is a deeper thing. So I'm actually quite happy with uh, uh, um, uh, single liners. Um, I prefer this, and I'm going to explain why I prefer this, because this is structured programming. None of the previous examples were. 
Um, on the other hand, we can go a little bit crazy and use go to. This is a very convoluted way of doing it. This is one of those ones where perhaps you're being paid by the line of code, but perhaps you're also afraid of your job security. Maybe if you write code that nobody else could understand, they'll never get rid of you. <laughs> Actually, no, we can do this even better. How about this? No, 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 I can do better than this. Or worse. This is, you know, this is just terrible. And I'd love to say, oh, I've never seen code like this, but I have seen code like this. I've seen it in C code bases, I've seen it in Fortran code bases. Um, I, once upon a time, I used to be a Fortran programmer. Um, and so here it is rendered in Fortran, Fortran 66, and uh, uh, yeah, but actually some of the programs I worked with would sometimes add extra keywords. They would take a short idea, and then I remember speaking to one developer, he said, what? I said, why are you putting return on the end before the end? Oh, he says, because you never know, the compiler might run off the end, it might forget to return. <laughs> the, and I'm, I'm sitting there going like, if, that, if the compiler can't even get that right, what else has it got wrong? <laughs> this is something kind of fundamental. You end a function, you return automatically. End means it ends, and we go back to wherever we were. It doesn't mean it ends and now we don't know what to do. It doesn't mean... Thanos clicks his fingers and suddenly half your program space disappears. It's a kind of like, yeah. And then I also knew programmers say, oh, no, 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 no. What we've got to do is have a special place for return, so we need to jump to it, use a go-to. Or jump all the way. So I used to see these long tail outs on some of these functions. They were quite bizarre, um, based on programming by superstition, if you like. Oh, we're not sure if it works. OK, quick. Somebody sacrifice a chicken. Um, copy some code in at the end. Let's put some extra go-tos in and let's all you know, have this kind of... So you can take something simple and turn it into something complex. It, it doesn't take a lot of effort. That's one of the things that software developers are actually also quite good at. Now, yeah, so half a, it's hard enough to understand with the ifs, but all of this stuff at the end, yeah. Let me show you something else. Most of what I actually programmed it was not Fortran 66. I had to look at Fortran 66. Most of what I did was Fortran 77 with a few extras. And Fortran 77 had a radical idea. Um, it had block structure. It allowed you to do structured programming. It allowed you to express alternatives at the same level. And this is quite a simple idea and yet quite a powerful one. We're going to come back to this idea later. Now, the Intelligent Guide to Designing Programs uh, which is actually a very, very interesting guide from the mid-1990s, um, had this very uh, uncompromising statement. A go-to completely invalidates the high-level structure of the code. We keep using this word structure, and it's beginning to raise the question, what do we mean by structure? It doesn't mean that go-to is wrong. It just means that what it does is it, if you have a structure, it messes it up. And if you like that, then well done. But if that's not where you want to go, then perhaps there's other ways of thinking about it. But it turns out this is to do with a model of thinking and a model of reasoning. So I want to show you another piece of C code, <coughs> back from the land before time. Um, this is an interesting one. And you might be looking at this, um, if, you've, if you've had any experience of curly bracket languages, not just C, but Java, C sharp, JavaScript, Whatever. You're looking at that going like, well, what happened here? I see a switch statement. No, wait a minute, I see a do-while statement. Ooh, hang on, I see both. It's like they've collided. Yeah, this is kind of the science fiction equivalent of what happens when you teleport into a wall. What happens when two things teleport into the same space? What happens when you teleport to the same place that the switch statement is, and you're a do-while loop? This is what happens. Um, fortunately, this is banned in all those other curly bracket languages. You can't do this anymore in these other languages. But this is known as Duff's device. And what it does is it was a, it's a loop unrolling. What we're doing here is we're making up for the fact that compilers back in the 70s and 80s were not as optimizing as they are now. These days, com optimizing compilers are profoundly good, like really good. 
like if you are a software developer and you try and look at the assembler output of um, an optimizing compiler and try and change what it does, you will probably break it because it doesn't look rational, what it's doing. It does things that seem counterintuitive, but it's all there for a reason. Um, and this is doing something called loop unrolling, which is a fairly standard thing that you will find in optimizing compilers and optimizing VMs. And loop unrolling is simply saying, what if I want to copy a bunch of bytes from one place to another? Now, this comes from um, Tom Duff work for AT&T. They do telecoms code. Classic idea, you want, to copy, you want to copy packets of stuff from one buffer to another. So that's great. And what you'd like to be able to do is not have to go around the loop all the time. So copy in chunks of eight bytes. But what happens if the buffer size is not a multiple of eight? This is what happens. What you do is the first time round, you jump to how the top, and then you cascade through. You jump to where you are. And then the next time round, you're just copying eights. So if I'm trying to copy 13 bytes, 13 mod eight is five. I jump to five, and then I do five copies. Then I go round once, and I copy the remaining eight. Okay, if I'm trying to copy 21, then 5 is the same remainder, and then I go around twice, copying 8, copying 8, six, 8, 16, and so on. So, this is a loop unrolling. I think Tom Duff's comment on it is the best. I feel a combination of pride and revulsion at this discovery. Many people have said that the worst feature of C is that switches don't break automatically before each case label. This code forms some sort of argument in that debate, but I'm not sure whether it's for or against. It is a work of art, though. Now, this is an interesting thing, is that the word break, in many of our programming languages, it actually um, it has problems. Because break is used for two different purposes. Nothing, ever, nothing bad ever happens when people use things for two purposes. Oh, yeah. One is normal that you break from a loop. The other is we can break from a switch, which is not a loop. And on a really bad day, speaking of AT&T, speaking of a bad day, perhaps back in 1990, they made a, there was a little typo. Um, a programmer was thinking, don't worry about all this stuff. This is Peter van der Linden's uh, 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 cre recreation of this. The important thing here is that mentally, the programmer was thinking, break exits a block. And they're thinking, oh, I'm going to leave a block. And the, the, the block there is the if statement. The problem is, that's not what's happening. In their head, it's what's happening. Because if that word if were a while or a for, then it would have exactly the right effect. It would jump to the end of the block. It would exit that construct. The problem is, that's not how break works. It's not to do with blocks. It's not to do with constructs, or in general, it's to do with certain constructs. And it turns out that what happens is that it was breaking the switch, it ended up leaving certain things uninitialized, which caused a failure, which caused a reset, which then sent the same message to other telecom switches, which caused the same bug to recur in those, which then sent, as they booted up again, sent, this became a cascading error. It engulfed the North American uh, uh, telephone system. Uh, it was a Monday, if I recall correctly. I could be wrong on that. Um, and for about five hours, there were about 150 million people that couldn't use their phones in North America. And this is back in 1990 when people actually used phones as phones. You know, you basically, and, and this was during working hours. You've just, you've just basically killed most of a working day uh, for North America. That turns out not to be cheap. So yeah, it turns out that these constructs have surprises. They are discontinuous. They break from the control flow that we understand. So, break has friends. These are all forms of go-to. They are limited, but it turns out that they are, they always create surprises for people. Um, but I want to talk about return very briefly, because return is an interesting one, because sometimes it's talked about in the context of structured programming. Um, sometimes people say, well, isn't structured programming that you should not have more than one return point from, you should not have more than one return from a function? Or you should have, not have more than one return statement from a function. Sort of, but not quite. It turns out, just as there are two breaks, there are two returns. The word return now means something different in most mainstream languages than it did back in the 1970s. C was not quite as mainstream 
in the 1970s as it became in the 1980s and 1990s. C began to dominate our language design thinking from the late 80s onwards. And you can see this in JavaScript and, and Java. Of all the syntax models they chose, they chose to start with C. Back in the 1970s, programming languages actually had a very different way of being organized, 60s and 70s to be precise. Um, if I go back to Fortran here, one of the things to notice is that there's no return statements here. How do we return a value from the function? The function is a Boolean function, or logical, to use Fortran terminology. How do we return from it? Well, it just, the name of the function is a variable inside the scope. Now, this used to make a certain amount of sense because you had to have really short names because we were short on storage and short on everything else. But this became eventually a bit awkward. We stopped doing this uh, in terms of language design. I don't know of any new languages that have been designed using this, this, this model. Um, but it was very, very common. Fortran did it, Pascal did it, and so on. So the point there is you never needed a return statement for any of this. Return in Fortran is what we would call a, a, a strict return. That's all it does. It doesn't return a value, it returns from block. So I can restructure this code using returns and just um, end ifs. If, and you can now see the two roles. One is, what is my return value? The other is, what is my return control flow? These are two separate concepts. The idea of separating concepts is perhaps more familiar to you as the single responsibility principle. One construct, one meaning. It turns out that the return statement in your programming language, most likely in your programming language, does two things. It doesn't do one thing. It returns control flow and it deals with data flow. These are two separate concepts, okay? So basically, most language design violates SRP. Um, but it used to be that it would look like this. So you'd emphasize this idea you could have these blocks and then do return. But there's not a lot of point in doing this because you could just do else if and then get rid of the return. In other words, the idea is that the block represents, um, you don't have to look inside the block to understand what's going on. I can look at the top level and understand the flow without looking at the nested parts. And this is what makes this structure of interest, the idea of nesting structure, so that I can now say the thing that is in the curly brackets, the thing that is indented, I don't need to worry about. That's what the return disrupts, and that's certainly what GoTo disrupts. It's the idea that you don't disrupt the top level view. So, where does that leave us? Well, let's have a look at some Groovy code. Let's go back to Leap here. Now, Groovy, I'm picking on Groovy because in Groovy, I can, write, I can write it like this, or I can write it like this. There's an interesting point here that the last expression, the last value of a block, the last value of a method, is the return value of that. So in other words, it, it automatically returns. So this is quite an interesting one, because we can now, let's rewrite this. I'll rewrite it like that, but I'll also rewrite it like this. One of these is structured, the other is not. And the way you find out is to find out, do I have, so in other words, I've got multiple returns in both, but in only one case, is the return actually doing the job, truly, of returning the control flow before we reach the end? And to find out, what we can do is simply replace the returns with, well, would this still work if I had expressions or values? Yes, the one on the left works. Okay, this is like uh, having an expression. So it all works. So the one on the left is pretty good. The one on the right, however, <coughs> doesn't work. It turns out that those other returns are doing two jobs. They are short-circuiting the control flow and they're returning a value. Yeah, so that one is the one on the right, so for consistency, I'll put that there. Turns out, for some reason, people have decided the one on the right is that there are, there are tools that encourage you to do the wrong thing. We had the whole structured revolution, so you could write the thing on the left. Turns out that this is the model of reasoning we want to encourage. The model of reasoning on the left, the top-level thinking, how do I separate that out? How do I get somebody to look at the, the indentation reflecting the reasoning? That was the idea. Okay, so this is the stru ones that structured, and we can actually see this if we rewrite this in Algol 68. 
um, which is a language that uses pure expressions, uh, well, not pure expressions, that uses expressions. Um, Algol 68, the clue is in the year 1968. Uh, this is a very procedural language, it's classic procedural language. Um, it uses expressions, it has lambdas. All of these ideas that people have got very excited about recently, but turned out to be 1960s ideas. Um, uh, Algol 68 is also one of the most influential languages you've never heard of, or never used. Um, Algol 68 is responsible for such innovations as using the word int, or bool. Everybody else was using the word integer at the time. Uh, the, uh, the authors of Algol decided, you know what, let's keep things short. So, um, this is where all these keywords came from. Anyway, we'll come back to Algol 68 later. So, uh, this is a bit of uh, Haskell. Um, again, this is one of the interesting things. It turns out that if you're writing structured programming, you're also actually using the same structure, uh, structuring model, nesting structured model, that you would use in functional programming. So, one of the simplest ways to improve your everyday use of imperative languages is to learn functional programming you will rediscover what structured programming is. It turns out the two ideas have very, very strong overlap in certain areas. Um, this is your classic Pascal. Again, Pascal was one of these languages where you could assign to the result, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the function name uh, to get the result, and no returns are necessary here. So, yeah, we've got some stuff here. Uh, this is one of the more interesting um, things when people sort of wonder about programming paradigms. This is, this is an example in Go. Um, sometimes people look at Go as if it's some kind of object-oriented language. It's not. It, the, it's a procedural language. A lot of people thought procedural programming was dead. That may still be, that may still be the case. Um, Go is a very procedural language. What it does is it takes ideas of the past and just rebrands them. Um, it is a very procedural language. It's mostly tidy. It's got some curious irregularities. But nonetheless, it's got some ideas there. This is how we might write it in Go. But Go also allows me to name the result type if I want. And we can actually see here exactly what I've had before. I've got a strict concept and a single return at the end. That unfortunately is required uh, when you use this construct. But yeah, we can make the point here. So this is all about being able to reason with stuff. Now I want to look at some other aspects of the arts. Um, drama, plays, literature, Shakespeare. Because it turns out we can learn a lot by looking into the past. It turns out that Shakespeare was actually a programmer. The problem is that, I mean, if you like, he was a script programmer, um, and he lacked computers, so he used the actor model, centuries before anybody else was using actors. Um, and it turns out that if you look closely at his works, you'll discover things. For example, Hamlet is a play about memory management. It's very cleverly disguised as a tragedy of the Prince of Denmark, but no, 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 don't be fooled. This is a play about memory management. Look, here it is, to be or not to be, that is the question. That is exactly, I'm looking at a pointer. Should there be an object at the other end or not? I don't know. This, is, this, is a, this cuts to the heart of the problems that we have with memory management. And it turns out that the whole play is about this. We see, for example, Hamlet is in favor of garbage collection. Yeah, I mean, we look carefully. Yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records. Uh, that's not important to me, let's get rid of it. Nobody's using that. Okay? So garbage collection, we take that for granted. It was present in languages like Algol 68, uh, Simula 67, the original object-oriented language. All of these are 1960s language, Lisp, and so on. But Ophelia had a different point of view. Ophelia believed in explicit memory management. C style memory management. Tis in my memory locked, and you yourself should keep the key of it. So it's your job to get rid of it. So we see this if we go to C. The primitives in C malloc, allocate memory, free, free up the allocated memory. Then realloc, let us reallocate to a new size existing memory that we've allocated. This seems not unreasonable as three primitives. If you're going to do explicit memory management, this is not a bad idea. But it gets messy, because it turns out that realloc is not as simple as we first assume. Realloc itself violates certain assumptions. So void pointers, void star, that's returning basically raw, untyped memory. 
You pass in a raw pointer and a size t is an integer type, an unsigned integer type. This is what I would like to resize this to. Please reallocate the memory at PTR to new size. Now, this seems reasonable until you realize what it actually does. If you pass in null, then it turns out realloc behaves like malloc. If you pass in zero for the new size, then it turns out that free uh, it behaves like free. This is actually not really what it should do. In the first case, it should just return null, saying I cannot resize nothing. There is nothing there to resize. So null would have been the right thing to do, not behave like malloc. And an object of zero size is an object of zero size. It's not the same as no object. Okay. Um, it's uh, if you like. It's what's the difference between an empty cup and no cup? Yeah. There is a very simple idea here. I can have an empty block of memory. That's not the same as no memory at all. So there's a kind of concept here that got muddled. Now, I saw this implementation of it a few years ago, and you'll see that this one uses jumpy returns. This one uses a non-structured approach. If, then return. If, then return. If, then return. So therefore, in order to understand any of it, I have to understand all of it. And this gets to the heart of why the structured model was quite interesting, because it was trying to allow you to understand what is, what is it that I'm looking at. Let me restructure this using structured programming. There you go. And it actually becomes clearer. You can see the three broad branches. You can actually see there's a separate piece of behavior there that's quite interesting. But what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to draw out the blocks. That's one block. These are the next blocks. The next block's in. When we talk about block structured programming, this is what we're talking about. The idea that we can treat a block of code, a region, on its own, we can get rid of everything else, and I can understand the overall structure of this. I don't, there are no shortcuts in here. I don't have to say, inside any one of these, I need to check that I have not broken out of the whole thing. This also has another interesting property. Let's just reduce it down a bit. The other interesting property it has is you can extract method very easily. In fact, it turns out that's one of the virtues of structured programming. It's trivial to refactor. Before refactoring tools, this was one of the techniques that you would use. And it was always difficult the minute anybody introduced a discontinuous piece of control flow, such as go to, wherever it exists, break, return, and so on. It turns out that when you are using these constructs to disrupt the control flow, it actually prevents you from refactoring easily. And some tools will just actually not allow you to refactor. They say, oh, I'm sorry, can't do that. Which explains why it is that the larger a function gets, the less likely it is to be able to be refactored, but also the more likely it is to have constructs like this. In case you're wondering about exception handling, don't worry about exception handling. Exception handling respects block structure. It's actually block structure. It may have, there may be other questions associated with it, but it doesn't violate this, uh, this uh, uh, transformation. So, let's go back to this book. Mm -hmm. So this book had a number of points to make. One of which is one of the most powerful mechanisms of block stru of program structuring is the block and procedure concept. This is very powerful indeed. Um, so, let's go back to the 1940s. Turns out none of these ideas are new. This is um, a, an example of Konrad Suse's uh, plan calcul, um, which can reasonably claim to be, it was never implemented at the time, he designed it uh, in the 1940s, it was first published in 1948. It had a little bit of influence, but it's a shame that it didn't truly influence um, uh, programming from then on. Um, obviously, it's a bit of a challenge for normal programmers because it's two-dimensional. But it has some really interesting ideas. It was block structured. It only had one short circuiting construct. For some reason, everything else is in German, but fun is end. Yeah. But, um, and this is a classic bubble sort, um, you know, which we would normally say, well, you know, but let's just be clear bubble sort was not invented for another decade. So I think using bubble sort whilst you're still in the process of inventing computer science is okay. Um, but it has a number of really interesting concepts. It has these primitives. And we can actually extract a number of primitives that later became the primitives of 
are programming languages, but also considered to be the primitives of structured programming, sequence, selection, and iteration. And we can even see when characterizing procedural programming as an architectural style, which goes by the rather clumsy name of main program and subroutine, the goal of structured programming as a, an application of procedural programming is to decompose a program into smaller pieces to help achieve modifiability. Well, I think that's the goal of any paradigm. You know, um, I'm not aware of any paradigm except, please don't sack me, um, that doesn't have this. If you're looking for job preservation and you write something that people can't understand and can't maintain. The program is decomposed hierarchically. That's the interesting thing. Looks like that. And it turns out that this is a top-down control flow structure. And it even has a particular architectural separation that has been forgotten by people. Um, afferent branch, transform branch, efferent branch. Input, process, output. So the idea is that you are taking something, transforming it, and then you're writing it out. Turns out that this is a really useful model for any problem that looks like that. Data processing is the classic example. And obviously, you know, there's typically a single thread of control, and you get control from your parent, and this is uh, optionally along with some data. And so the whole paradigm is based on the decomposition of control flow in a tree-like structure. And it doesn't matter what we call it. We can call it subroutine, procedure, or function. But what's curious is that we call it function, we suddenly realize, wait a minute, half of this is what we also call functional programming. It's a strict top-down decomposition. Of course, it's never truly strict. I mean, the world is a messy place. You end up with recursion, you end up with mixing layers. So it's not perfectly tree-like. Um, so we should also be slightly aware that although this is very elegant, and this is why it appeared in computer science papers a lot, um, <coughs> everything should be built top-down except the first time. It turns out that the top-down model of describing something is a great way of describing something. It's not always a good way of building something. Let's build it, see what it is, and now we can describe it. That's actually probably a little more realistic. It turns out that a lot of the ideas about top-down programming we're based on an idealized version of the human being. It turns out we're not very good at thinking ahead like that. It turns out we don't really know what we're building until we built it. That is the very nature of software. To program it is to learn how to understand it. You can't understand it and then program it. Okay? If you're ever dealing with a software development methodology that says first you understand it and then you program it, they have not understood programming. Okay? Programming is a process of understanding. That's what you're doing. You're arranging your thoughts. So the first time you write something, it's probably not going to be the best version you have. I also like this observation from Tony Hoare. You cannot teach beginners top-down programming because they don't know which end is up. <laughs> Notice that all of our metaphors, when we talk about programming paradigms and architectural models, and frameworks, the languages that we use, are all about the real world. They're all metaphorical. There is no up in software. There's no such thing as an up. There's no top. There's no down. We impose these because we are human beings. It allows us to reason about the code. It makes it convenient for us. We are the principal audience. So why would we not choose something to make the abstract more concrete? The real world is a good start. However, to be fair, we're not very good with this. This is a tree. This is a tree. It turns out that in software, all our trees are upside down. We don't even notice anymore. Once you've been working in software development, you naturally think of the root as being at the top. I remember telling my children this, and this was one of those moments where they looked at me and go like, you're kidding, right? You're making this one up, Dad. No, no, this is real. No, this is one of those ones where you're fooling us and making us believe something that's not true. No, really, it is true. We, we got up and down confused. So the leaves are at the bottom and the root is at the top. But that also allows us to observe that trees are very common as an organizational concept within um, the world of software. We find it convenient because they have these nesting structures. Sometimes we have to break outside of that nesting structure. That is pragmatic and it's sometimes realistic. But sometimes we also probably do it more than we should. So I want to talk a little bit about Michael Jackson. Now, you might be familiar with Michael Jackson um, from uh, uh, the uh, classic computer science works of Thriller. 
um, and bad. Uh, but it turns out that uh, he was also involved in a few other ideas. Um, or it was a different Michael Jackson. I suspect it was a different Michael Jackson. Um, this is a book that is a really, uh, this is a book from the 1990s, uh, published in 1995. It's a classic book with an incredibly dull title. Software Requirements and Specifications. I think I would struggle to make anybody interested in a book with that title. You know, it's not kind of like requirements to still or how to do specifications in 21 days or, you know, you won't believe what happens when you, you know, whatever. Um, you get a sense there might be more to it than this when he says, a lexicon of practices, principles, and prejudices. This is an alphabetically ordered book. And the first section is on A. In fact, the first entry in the book, so it's a series of essays, about 70 or so essays, alphabetically structured that cross-link. And it is on some really interesting points about understanding what we can and cannot say in software, its construction and requirements. It's a classic book in this sense. And the first entry in the book is arboricide. Arboricide is not a common English word. In fact, it might not even have been an English word until this book. Arboricide is the murder of trees. The victims of arboricide are the descriptive tree structures that are so often found in software. Okay? Software development should not be a trade of constructing difficulty from simplicity. Although sometimes it feels like that. You take a simple idea and then we build software and make it complex. But somewhere in there is a simple idea struggling to get out. Quite the contrary. Where there are trees to be shown, you should show them and refrain from turning the relationships they describe into a puzzle. Arboricide then is using a smaller description span when a larger one would be better. Again, notice this is about specifications, it's about description, it's about understanding. And this applies right across the board, not just these simple ideas of structure that I'm talking about in terms of control flow. So these are the things that in classic programming languages would disrupt the tree, so to speak. So let's go back to this. And I'm gonna show you something a little bit more surprising because we've said this already. The block procedure concept one of the most powerful. How powerful is it? Let's find out how powerful it is. So it turns out that um, psychotherapists are obsessed with objects. It's not just software developers. And this is a stack of books. So what I want to do is I want to show you a stack. I'm going to show you a block of code. This is in Simula 67, um, which is the first object-oriented language. Uh, the, clue, the clue to the year is in the name, 67. Um, it is based on the work of uh, Kristen Nigard and Uli Johan Dahl, um, and their previous work, Simula 1, which is 1965. And they took Algol 60 and did some extensions to it. Now, first of all, let's just understand, this is a block. That's an array of books. I've got a count that counts how many books I've got. And then I'm going to initialize it to zero, and I'm going to have a number of procedures. Um, and obviously what we're going to do is we're going to, we're, first of all, we're going to talk about the most over-specified data structure in the whole of computer science, which is the stack. Um, but push pop is empty, is full, depth and top. Okay, that's kind of good. So what's this got to do with anything? Because this looks just like a regular block. Right, this is where it gets interesting. This is how powerful this construct is. A procedure which is capable of giving rise to block instances which survive its call will be known as a class. Hmm. And the instances will be known as objects of that class. Well, that is interesting. Because normally when you think of a block, you think we go into the block, we do what's in the block, then we come out and we abandon it. That's like a stack. It's like your call stack. It's so, it's so obvious, or rather it's so ingrained into you, you don't even notice you're thinking that. But what if that block lived on? What if you went into that block, executed stuff, and at the end you were left with... A block, you can have a reference to a block, and now you can pass this block around. And that block, what does it have inside it? It has state, the variables, and it has behavior, any functions or procedures that you nested inside it. That's a really nice idea. You know what, you could build a whole paradigm off that. It turns out that this quote is taken from the book Structured Programming, in the section Hierarchical Program Structures. It turns out that the original model of Structured programming included the concept of object-oriented programming. We've, somehow in the past we ended up separating the two. 
probably because this was the last section of the book, and you know what happens to the last section. It never gets read or remembered. And there were three broad sections to the book, and only the first one, if you were a Fortran programmer or a COBOL programmer, you could only, the first one was the only one you could apply. The second section, if you were a C programmer, you could probably apply. But the third section, you probably couldn't apply, therefore you'd forget it. It turns out that if you just add the word class in front of a block, then it now has this existence. You give it a name. And now you can pass around the contents of that block by reference. That is all an object is. There is nothing fancy to it. Except, of course, this was invented in 1936. By, um, well, actually 1932, by Alonzo Church. It turns out Lambda Calculus has this idea of being able to capture its context. So, I'm going to switch to JavaScript just to show you what that looks like in a pure object model, which is kind of curious because I think some people would be very surprised that I'm using the word JavaScript and pure in the same sentence. Um, trust me, I, nobody's more surprised than me. Uh, but it turns out as a side effect of many things, there is a small elegant object model inside trying to get out, but it can be expressed purely in terms of landers. Um, so I'm going to new stack. When I call new stack, it's a create, it calls a block, and the block returns, it has state items, and it's going to return a record, or an object, which will now have corresponding behaviors. And now what you do is you just return, here is a block of behaviors, and it returns to this truly <coughs> private state. I can even change the behavior, or the implementation, and externally there's nothing you can do to detect that there was a difference. It's a very powerful idea. It's a very pure object model, interestingly enough, just built using lambdas. Um, what about inheritance? Well, it wasn't called inheritance originally. It was called concatenation. You take the attributes and you concatenate them. But rather than thinking in terms of classes, we're going to be actually much more object-oriented. I can do this with objects. Concatenation consists of merging the attributes of both components. OK. Well, let's imagine our, instead of a stack, we'll have a stackable. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass in a base object that I would like to add or mix behavior in. This is the basis of what's known as the mix-in model of objects. What you do is you mix in extra behaviors. And so I can actually take an existing object and use an inheritance or concatenation, quite literally. So I can now compose new types. I can make something clearable. I can make it stackable. So I can have a stack that is clearable and stackable. In other words, the idea of the object model here is that you make things composable out of small pieces, which is quite nice. Very small pieces. In fact, we can even generalize it and just say, yeah, I'm going to have a composition model and build it out of functional primitives. So this is kind of an interesting one, not what people normally expect when you talk about structured programming. So you end up with Hierarchies, hmm. trees, concept hierarchies. We, these days we call them inheritance hierarchies. Perhaps if people have, I mentioned um, uh, single responsibility principle earlier, people who come across the solid uh, principles, which are not actually very solid and not really principles, but there are a couple of ideas in there that are worth pursuing. Um, the other one is Liskov's principle. And Liskov, Liskov's substitution principle, she originally characterized this as the intuitive idea of a subtype is one whose objects provide all the behavior of objects of another type, the supertype, plus something extra. And then she had a more formal way of describing it, which I'm going to skip for the moment. But it turns out that we can demonstrate this. It turns out, and I'm going to pick up on my opening theme, it turns out you can demonstrate conformance to inheritance in a structured model simply by using tests. So I'm going to create a new kind of mix-in, a new kind of behavior that I'm going to add to my stack. I'm going to have the idea that when you push something onto the stack that's already there, you don't, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't get pushed. So you have non-duplicate top. You don't end up repeating the top item when you push it. So non-duplicate top. Now, I'm going to create a simple test. And the test is a non-empty stack becomes deeper by retaining a pushed item as its top. And there you go, new stack, push IT days, push 2019, push 2019, the depth is three, the top is 2019. When I run this with clearable and stackable, it passes, it's green. 
When I also mix in non-duplicate top, it fails because the depth is two. In other words, it turns out that if you try and implement this behavior and say that this stack is a true kind of stack, then it's not a true kind of stack. It's, it fails the substitution principle. And this is a very simple way of understanding the substitution principle, which sounds very abstract in terms of just tests. Okay, so that's all good. So what I want to focus on here is this idea that our code should be reasonable. Now, reasonable is an interesting word in English because it has two meanings. To say that something is reasonable is to say that it's okay. I found the weather this morning reasonable. It's okay. If somebody says, is this code reasonable? Yeah, it's okay. But it also has another meaning, which is based, it's original meaning, which is based on reason. In other words, can I reason about it? Can I think about it? As a developer, can I come to this code and put it in my head and reason about it clearly and comfortably, with confidence, in a way that means I'm probably going to get more things right than I get wrong? What more could we ask? And it's interesting because this is Yakil Kimchi, he, he talked about coding with reason, and this is exactly his concept. He actually offered a very different way of looking at GoTo that he ties in with reason, avoid using GoTo statements as they re make remote sections highly interdependent. But he also talks about data. This is the point. The reason that GoTo is difficult to work with is because it makes disconnected things connected in a way that is counterintuitive. Uh, avoid using modifiable global variables as they make all sections that use them dependent. It turns out the same thinking. These are not just things that people thought of to put in coding guidelines because they were bored. It's not just an artifact of old programming languages. We actually find that this is a problem. If you're dealing with JavaScript on a page, the page has global variables. It's an absolute mess. In terms of understanding the side effects and how things are changed, this is why we constantly have the reinvention of JavaScript frameworks, and it's why the latest phase of more reactive-oriented frameworks over the last decade, they've tried to get rid of the idea of modifiable state. So, um, do I want to stick around with this? Yeah, I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to skip this. Now, all I'm going to do is cunningly remember um, how to... Let me think. Uh, let me think. I'm, going to, I'm going to skip a bunch of slides which are all very interesting. Um, and oh, that's very interesting. That's also quite interesting. Uh, that's quite interesting. Oh, this is really interesting, but I'm going to skip it. Um, actually, no, I'm not going to skip it. I'm going to go back a couple, and we can, we can end there. So the uh, point here is I want to talk a little bit about this question of concurrency, because people struggle with this. Um, so. Uh, Aldra Alexandrescu had this wonderful observation, multi-threading is just one damn thing after, before, or simultaneous with another. How does all this work, structured reasoning work with multi-threading? Well, multi-threading messes up structure horrifically. And it gives us problems of race conditions, um, which are best, you know, take me down to concurrency where green pretty is the girl. We have sequencing problems. All our sequencing problems are related to state. And our favorite mechanism for dealing with state is the mutex, which was just introduced as a, as a variable name by Dijkstra originally. And he had some really good advice on, you know, don't spend too much time locking. But I always liked David Butenhoff's observation back in the 1990s. I've often joked that instead of picking up Dijkstra's Q acronym, mutex, we should have called the basic synchronization object the bottleneck. Because from a language point of view, that would be great. You get a developer, two developers talking about code. It's just like, yeah, we've got some threaded code here. Yeah, I think it's unsafe. We need to put a bottleneck here. The minute you say that, it doesn't sound as clever as Mutex. Mutex has kind of like, sounds a bit more computer science-y. Which reminds us, this is what we're doing. We have chosen, it turns out there are consequences to non-structured thinking. It turns out that messing about with coordination of state is a non-block model. It turns out, that we're also not getting performance benefits. It turns out that a three gigahertz multi-core weight takes just the same amount of time as a one gigahertz single core weight. All you're doing is you're slowing your code down. That's what you're doing when you do this stuff. 
And what is interesting is that we can reason about this. When we look at the complexity of our code, and why it is that we've ended up with, we, I think we, we have nothing to learn from structured programming, but we do. Structured programming is all about locality. So we can separate our state into mutable and immutable. We can make state shared or unshared between threads. And there's only one, there's one quadrant of danger here. If you share and change, then you have a problem. But everything else is good. Somehow we've ended up with a lot of code in here. So we need to avoid that. Um, right, so I'm going to sort of wrap up with Nicholas Wirth's observation. It was a book title. Algorithms plus data structure equals programs. That was a very simple view that probably worked for computer science in the 1970s. But a view that is perhaps more constructive now and helps us reason about our thinking and why it is that we want to have a structure that allows at least the ability to reason top down, even if we don't build it top down the first time, is that perhaps the way we need to think about modern systems is the structure is based on computation, bits of computation that we coordinate and that we have a clear separation between how I glue the bits together. Some of them are nested inside each other, some of them are, are glued together, some of them concatenate. In other words, it's about the arrangement. It's a much, much deeper philosophy. And therefore, the danger that we deal with on an everyday basis is the lack of structure. We don't call structured code legacy code. We just call it code I'm working on. But the minute we lose the sense of the structure, we lose the ability in our heads to understand the coordination between the components. That is when it becomes legacy. We lose touch of that. So hopefully I've helped you remind remind you of what we mean by structure, but also a little bit of a history lesson uh, that perhaps we can take some of this stuff going forward. Thank you very much.